How's everybody doing today? Um, I'm very happy to be here in India. Thank you to the organizers of Enclosure for inviting me. Um, I've just had such a warm welcome. Um, I know this won't be my last time in India. So thank you very much. All right. Um, so I want to talk about a problem that I hear a lot of people complain about uh, in the closure world. And it has to, a lot to do with using data. And we get like these really deeply nested maps. And we forget what keys we have and what we're supposed to, what entity we're supposed to use in certain places, what's supposed to be in this map. Um, so let's talk about the symptoms of this problem. Um, very common complaint is, I can't remember what keys I'm supposed to use in this map. Very common. Uh, well, first, show of hands, this, who, who feels this? I was talking to a few, oh wow, about half of you have raised your hands, okay. Um, yeah, I was talking to someone yesterday here at the conference and it just seemed like, they were like, yes, yes, how do I do that? So I'm, I'm glad I'm talking about this. Um, I don't know what kind of map I have. What is, what is this even, I, I, I got this passed to me in this function and like, what do I, what is it? Um, another common problem. Um, uh, awkward code for manipulating these deeply nested structures. So here's an example. Um, so this is a, a map that represents this uh, space voyage. Um, Y'all recognize him, I suppose. Yes, Rakesh Sharma. Um, all right, so here's some code that will manipulate this. We basically want to capitalize all of the names of the crew members of different missions. So we can kind of analyze it uh, just by looking at it. We're doing maps, so map V, which means we're mapping over a vector. So it's a vector of missions, and then inside the crew key, there's another vector of crew members. We're doing two updates. We had to define three anonymous functions. Now this is, this is awkward code. You know, it takes a while. This is actually kind of well written, you know, well formatted, well organized. Everything's well named. But still, look at the indentation. Look at how big it is and how deeply nested it is. Uh, so this is a problem I see a lot. Um, and then, Long functions. You know, we're told that we're supposed to have functions like one to three lines, and then you go into your code base and there's this big monster 30 line function. And it's usually stuff like this uh, four times, four things like this, trying to manipulate these data structures and put new things together and come up with new combinations of them. And we do it all in one big function. So it's a, it's a problem I see. Uh, there's a couple of technological solutions. You know, it's, it's, these are common problems. Uh, there's spec and there's specter. So spec is good at at least checking that you're using the right keys. Right? It'll, it'll help you with that. It'll also help you remember them, because at least you had to write them down somewhere, and you can go look it up. Uh, and also, like what kind of entity you have, it can it can help you with that. Uh, there's a the library Spectre. You all familiar with Spectre? Um, it's not very commonly used, as far as I know, uh, but it helps manipulate these deep data structures. So it has these this composable system for like reaching deep down into a data structure, and like you could do stuff like uh, capitalize every other name. You know, something like that. And there's a, a, instead of having to pull it apart and then put it back together, you just do it in one step. Uh, and then I don't think there's anything really for dealing with long functions. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's really even a technological solution. I just wanted to mention these because I think that they do show that the problem is real and that people are feeling this problem. But I'm not going to go into them anymore. Okay, I'm, I don't want to deal with this on a technological level. I don't think it's a technological problem. I actually think it is a social problem, or a design problem, let's call it. 
So the underlying cause of all these symptoms is that we're working at the wrong level of meaning. We have this expression. I actually heard it a few times yesterday here. It's just data. It's one of the advantages of closure. You don't have to make all these classes, other kinds of abstractions, just to start working. You just treat the thing as data. It's just data. But I think that that is misunderstood. It doesn't mean you don't come up with new levels of meaning and, and uh, like neglect the data. It's data and it's got meaning. So just as an example, this is some data. What, what's the outer thing? What is this piece of data? What kind of data is this? What kind of data structure? Someone shout it out. A map, a map. OK, yes, it's a map. But it's also something else. It's also this first thing is a character. It's a bunch of characters, right? So this is what I mean by going at different levels. You can actually see that there's this, this code. It's a map, but it's also just a sequence of characters, right? So it's actually, you can go down, it's bytes on the disk. And to turn it into characters, you put it through a reader. To take those characters, you do a read. It turns it into syntax. And then you can eval it. It turns into closure semantics. And then you have all the code that you wrote that makes it at another level of meaning about space travel. Right? And so this is your domain code. And this is what you, uh, this, this is your job is this last step. Right? So what my, what I'm trying to say is that it's just data means that you can always go up and down this, this tree. But you should want to work up at the top. So I'm, I'm, let's just look at that top part. So you have closure code at the bottom. This forms the base of your, of your uh, system. And then you're going to import a bunch of libraries, and those sit on top of closure. And then you write your domain code on top. OK, so you're, these are like layers of meaning that you're adding. Closure code is very abstract. It's general purpose. It doesn't know anything about space travel. Neither do your libraries, usually. But then your domain code is all about that. OK, so let me, um, let me show you one of the problems, like uh, an illustration of this problem, and how we get to here where we forget the keys, we have these gigantic maps that we don't know what belongs in them, what they mean. So here's some uh, reagent code. And you'll notice it's got a component uh, up at the top. So it defines an atom, a reagent atom. It's got a component and then another component that uses that component. But I want to focus on this line here. So this makes a button, so it has an on-click handler. And notice what it does. It swaps directly into the atom. Right? This is, it's just data. We're just, we're just adding something to this map that's in the atom, the favorite color. Now that's cool. Let me like graphically represent this. So let's say we add another component that lets you select your favorite animal. It also just associates right into the atom. We add another thing, and another thing, and another thing, and pretty soon we've got all these keywords that could be in that atom. But where are they defined? All throughout the UI, right? The, the, the definition of what we will find in that atom is smeared all over your code. There's no one place where these are listed. And so when you go to say, let's refactor, you don't even know what, where to look. How do we know what is modifying this user info? You might be able to grep for like associates to user info, but even that won't find everything. And so just little by little, we started with data, and we never turned it into a new layer of meaning. We just, we just added one thing after another. Pretty soon, you've got a team of 10 people. You've got hundreds of components. All of them are adding stuff to this map, and you're, you're in a mess. You don't know what to do. So every time you make one of those things, you're thinking up here at your domain level. 
you're thinking, oh yeah, favorite color, that's a really important concept. We gotta save that to the atom. But really, you just write a little swap with an associ, right? So you're writing down at the data level, right? You're just doing this little basic operation. That's the mismatch. You're thinking up here and you're writing down here. You need to write where you're thinking. Um, so here's, an, here's how we could fix this. So here's that same line of code, just extract it out. It's all just closure core libraries. And how do you turn it into something at a higher layer of meaning? Not a higher level of abstraction. It's actually less abstract than a, a soci is very abstract, right? It's any key value pair. We want just favorite color. So how do we turn this into a new layer of meaning? We just, the only thing we can do, we give it a name. We give this operation a name, we define a function, and there we have it. Now I see some, some maybe skeptical looks, um, that maybe this is too simple, that I'm just giving something like uh, too basic, like might be basic, but we don't do this enough, right? We don't actually sit there and think about what our operations should be. Okay, so let's look at it some more. So here's the old code. This is what it's gonna look like when we change it. And then we're also gonna have to add I, I suggest adding a new namespace called user info where all those operations are gonna go. So we add this set favorite color function there, and then we can also add the other ones, the set favorite animal, set favorite fruit. And they all look very similar, but now we have this nice, an, a nice check. Before, if you misspelled the keyword, nothing was gonna bother you. Nothing would check that you got it wrong. But if you're calling a function, instead of just associating a keyword, if that function doesn't exist, is gonna tell you. So that's another advantage to this. All right, another objection you might have is that this is just a lot of code. It's true, it's more code. Let's count it up. So we had one line before, okay? Now we have three. So it's three times the code. That's the, the con, the pros. It's three times the code, but you can find it in one third of the time. You can see all of the keys right there in that one namespace. Um, another thing is as you do this, as you factor things out into their own operations, you'll probably find some duplication. Like you are setting the favorite color in two different places. And so you won't have to make a separate function for each of those. Um, another thing is that the parts can evolve separately. You've got one layer of indirection where you can make changes without having to touch your UI. So before, if you wanted to change the key for favorite color, you'd have to go to the UI and then to whatever else is looking in that atom for the favorite color. Now, you just can change it in one place. And then also, it's less to keep in your head. You won't have to think about what, what are all of the keywords that I, I might encounter here. You have these operations and they, are, they can be tested, they're well defined. Those are, it's a smaller set to keep in your head. Okay, so let's go back to this layer of meaning uh, diagram. So as you add more and more code, you're increasing the size of your domain code. Right? It's, it's getting bigger and bigger. So at some point, you're going to reach a limit where you're gonna need some other organizing principle for this code. You can't just rely on, oh, I'm just moving it into namespaces and stuff. So what do you need to do? You make more layers, okay? More layers, your code becomes different layers. Uh, let's take a look at that. So here's a, a similar map to what we had before with the um, Soyuz T11 mission. So let's say um, Rakesh needs to do some centrifuge training. So his, his crewmates are wishing him luck. Good luck, it's really hard. They're gonna spin you around in this big machine really fast. So good luck. Okay, so he passes, all right. It's, it's close, but he passes. And so now we need a set that he passed it in this map. Take a look at this. 
a soch in. So we get a mission, and then in the crew key, under the research cosmonaut position, in that person's training map, under the centrifuge training, set the status to pass. So who has stuff like this in their code? This really long pass. Yeah, I see a few shy hands going up. <laughs> um, this is a problem. This is, this is um, an indication that you, you have deeply nested maps, but you haven't really thought about the segmenting it into different things that have their own coherent meaning to them. Okay, that they form a kind of integral concept. So I would break this up. So I drew some lines. So the crew and the research cosmonaut, I'm calling that, that's part of the mission, okay? The, the mission knows the crew key and that there's gonna be position keywords under that. And then training is part of the crew member, the person. And then the centrifuge and status, that is something that I'm gonna call training record, okay? So now I'm breaking this up into different parts. And I actually think two or maybe three is probably the longest path you should, you should use. So this will work for this. Okay, uh oh, sorry, I had the diagram here. So mission, person, and training. So that means we're gonna have to make namespaces for these. So up at the top we have the training, and we're gonna do a set status. So it takes the training record, and it takes um, the training, the name of the training, and it sets the status in that record. Very easy. All this code is very easy to write, by the way. That's the nice thing about it. Um, person, instead of knowing what the training record looks like, it just calls the training set status on uh, whatever is in its training key, right? And then mission doesn't know what the person looks like, what the person record looks like. It just knows where to find it and then what operation it's trying to call on it. And this is a separation so that they can evolve separately, they can change separately. If you've got a couple of paths like that in your code, some deep associ ins or, or update ins, you're actually tying, uh, you're coupling the structure of those maps all along that path to this other place in the code where it's just being used. You want to have these isolated uh, entities that you can deal with uh, on their own and modify and update and evolve on their own. So then what this turns into is we have these layers on top of libraries, we have our training layer, and then a person refers to that training layer, so we'll put it above it. And then a mission has many people in it, so that goes above it. And then somewhere up top, there's probably some more in there. But somewhere up top, we've got the UI. All right, so this, in the OO world, they talk about this all the time. They call it the law of Demeter. So in the OO world, you're not supposed to do like a long chain where you're like, the missions, crew members, uh, research cosmonauts, training, you're not supposed, you know, the dot, you can't have like a long chain of dots. That's actually considered uh, bad form because you're tying in that whole chain. You're, you're reaching into the object and you have to know so much about this huge chain of objects. You should know as little as possible about everything down the line, how things are implemented. So I mentioned object-oriented programming and the law of Demeter, so I expect that someone out there is thinking, aren't I just encapsulating? It's all supposed to be data. Like, why, why would you want to encapsulate this? Um, okay, my answer is we are encapsulating and it is just data, right? They, they're not in conflict. We're encapsulating it mentally. Mentally, we can operate on this map as if it were this very small, well-understood thing. But then, at the end of the day, it is just data. There's actually a tension between a, a, a map, a generic key value store, 
and an entity, which is a thing that has meaning and, and its own operations, the things that are valid on it. So we can move between these two. And we have to be conscious of where we are, how we're thinking about it when we're writing code. OK, so there's nice things about treating it just like a map, right? It's an entity, but it's also we can treat it like a map. You can print it out. You can serialize it to JSON. Uh, you can enumerate the keys if you need to. Uh, you can store it in a database, compare it with equals. There's all these things that we can do when we just treat it like data, and that's great. You can't do that with a class, an object-oriented class, right? You have to write your own equals method, right? You have to write your own hash code. And with this, it's a map. It just works with all these things that work well with maps. But lastly, I want to say that you don't have to do the design up front. At the REPL, you can do an associ, you can do an update in right there without writing the operation. You can figure it out first. You can write those in your UI and then later refactor it out because it's faster, right? But you should refactor it out at some point into the entity. So when we're talking about the entity, we're talking about domain operations, a small subset of, or a small defined set of things that are valid to do on this object. Makes it conceptually smaller, and easier to understand. And it, it lets us program at the high level. It also lets us maintain these invariants, like you wouldn't want a crew member with an empty name or like a number for the name, right? So this is something that a map will never be able to do. But if you put constraints in there, you can have an entity that makes sense. Um, all right, so at this point, I just want to talk about some more like tricks and ways to think about this. Um, there's a thing, what we're talking about here with all these layers of meaning is called stratified design. They talk about it in structure and interpretation of computer programs. And the idea behind stratified design is that you're building layers of meaning on top of existing layers of meaning. And there's some constraints to it. Um, I'm using this example here of cooking, cuisine. Um, so at the bottom, there's chemistry, right? You can't escape chemistry, acids and bases and proteins and starches. Those are all there. On top of that, you've got some very basic um, concepts like applying heat and chopping, some skills like that. Then on top, we'll put ingredients. Now this is a design system. It's designed, right? These concepts do, uh, they, you know, you could put them in another order, but this is how I chose to do it. So I put ingredients on top of chopping because you have to, the ingredients will know how they need to be chopped, right? So you can say a carrot needs to be chopped this way, but, you know, uh, an onion chopped this way. Uh, all right, then on top of that, there's the basics. So how to make a basic sauce, right, or how to make a dough. Those things we'll have to know about ingredients. And then finally at the top, we can start talking about recipes. We can start talking about how to, you know, make a dosa, something like that. Now, there's... The nice thing about this is when you draw it out like this, there's some nice constraints that help you figure out where your layers are. Um, the first principle is that you can separate things according to rates of change. Chemistry does not change, right? It's always the same. But then the dishes can change. The recipes can change. You could imagine if, um, so this I did um, like Indian cuisine, but if you went to French cuisine, how much stuff would you have to change? Well, chemistry obviously is going to work the same there in France. Applying heat and chopping, those are probably the same. Maybe you'd have to add or remove some vegetables or some other ingredients. But then definitely the dishes and the basics are going to be different. So the stuff at the top changes much more frequently than the stuff at the bottom. And that's, that's great, because it means that you're, you're you're actually finding stuff that is universal, that you can use and reuse for the lifetime of your software. And then the stuff at the top 
yeah, that changes and it flips, but look, nothing is depending on it. Nothing is built on top of it, and that's fine. So usually at the top, you'll have something like your business rules or your UI, which changes a lot, right? I'll move this button over here, or we, you know, that kind of stuff. Those things change very, very quickly. Uh, another principle is that uh, the dependencies have to point downward. So just as, as a, a kind of an absurd example, um, it would be weird if two things at the same level referred to each other. One should be on top. Unless, if they don't refer to each other, they can be at the same level. So it would be weird if applying heat depended on chopping, right? It would also be weird if the carrot knew the dishes that it, was, that it could be made in, right? You'd, you want the dependency to be the other way. So let's, let's X those out. Uh, similarly, uh, it's, not, it's not wrong to skip layers, but it might be a code smell if you're skipping layers. For instance, you wouldn't want to define your dosa in terms of chemistry, right? You wouldn't want it to be like, uh, create a starch and water solution with this pH and apply heat, and that's, that's your dosa recipe, right? You, you actually want to build it out of stuff that's higher level than that. So be careful of uh, skipping layers. Sometimes you're going to skip layers, though. Like if you've got a map, you're probably going to still associate to it, so you're still using the closure core when you're talking about the high level. But you can also define it in terms of other stuff. Okay, another trick uh, that I use uh, for, for avoiding these, these kinds of problems is I use constructors. So when I define an entity type, um, I make a function that will generate that uh, entity with all the keys that I need. And this function is great because it gives you a place to like, define the, the, the keys, check the, for required ones, maintain some invariance, those kinds of things. So let's look at an example. Uh, here I'm using this convention of arrow person to mean construct a person. Um, and I'm using the keyword argument destructuring. So I use the ampersand and then a map destructuring with keys so I can, um, I can get some keys out of there. Okay, so this is just a very simple one. I've got name and trainings as the two arguments. And notice I've got a default for trainings, so an empty vector. Uh, I've also, I'm also checking that the, the name is a string, right? That's an invariant I want to check. Uh, I'm doing a little calculation. I'm trimming it, getting rid of the white space on the outside. Then I'm making sure that it's not empty. That's an invariant I wouldn't want to mess up. And then I'm naming the keys and, and making the map, okay? Does anyone do this? Define constructors? Because it's, it's very common to just do like an inline map. And then, of course, if you want to change something, you want to change a key, now you have to go find all the places where that inline map defines that entity. This lets you, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't look that different, right? It's going to be arrow per, you know, open paren, arrow person, and then key value pairs, right? So it's not that different from just open braces. But it gives you a place to, to if you need to, to change things, and, and a good place to look for all the definitions. OK, this tip is a little bit harder to explain, um, but I think it's really important, um, especially, um, so as, as people progress in functional programming, uh, they often get to this stage where they say, well, it's all about uh, data transformation pipelines. Right? And, and that's true, that we use data transformation pipelines a lot, and it's a very powerful thing. But we, we, there's more beyond that. And unfortunately, we don't talk enough about that, that you can actually go beyond just pipelines of data transformation. And this is one, one thing that's beyond it, combining operations. So. Um, we choose, these, we choose to do these operations because they're hard. They're the hardest ones. It's really easy to do an operation that's just an associ, 
right? That's easy. Uh, but it's so obvious, like, it's, it's kind of pointless. When you've got these combining operations, what do I mean by combining operation? So if I'm writing a, um, a contact app, so I'm keeping my friends, their email addresses, their phone numbers, and I want to sync it, what do I have to, what data do I need to combine the stuff on my phone with the stuff on my computer? Right? I've got this record of their email address on this computer, and I change it on this computer. And then when they sync, how does it choose which one? That's a hard operation. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to constrain the kinds of data you have to keep. You can't just keep a map. Because if you, if you have two maps and you merge them, it's one of, something's going to get deleted. Right? So you need something more. You need like either the time it was changed or what computer it was changed on. Maybe you need a way to maintain multiple email addresses. You say, oh, you had this email address and this one. Now you'll have both. Right? This, is, this is a design problem that you have to think about. It's easy to say, set this person's email address. That's, that's too easy to start with. You want to start with the how do we combine two. And if you start with that, there's all sorts of uh, constraints that actually make the data, make it easier. It's a good thing that you have constraints. Like, we can't just keep a map. We need something more. That's a constraint. Uh, and then also it gives you a potential for algebraic reasoning. For instance, you might want to say, look, I don't want it to depend on what order these computers connected to the internet. I want, I want a it, no matter which one connects first, at the, at the end, when they've both connected, I've got the same answer. So that's an algebraic reasoning, that A plus B is the same as B plus A. Right? So let's look at some simple uh, code for this. So this is in my training namespace. All right, so let's say um, Rakesh was doing some training in India and some training in the USSR. And so when... Um, you combine these, there's a rule that says, well, if you pass the centrifuge in India, but you failed in the USSR, that's fine. You still can go to space, right? You passed somewhere, that's good enough. So we make a function that captures that idea. We call it combined training statuses. And it takes two training statuses, A and B. And so basically, if A or B is a pass, it returns pass. Otherwise, it returns fail. Then we can make a function that takes two training records and does a merge with this uh, status combining operation. Right? So that way, uh, India can keep its records, Russia keeps its records, and then boom, at the end of the day, you can merge them. So this is what I mean by combining operations. This isn't like some inline if statement where I'm like, oh, if Rakesh did this and then that, and I will. this is like uh, defining how these records can combine in one place as an operation. All right. Um, so now I just want to go over some code smells for what to look for in your code that um, could lead you to find layers of, of, the, of these meanings. OK, so we, we went over this one. Really deep paths, really long paths. Um, I think three or more is a smell. Two is okay, because you have some structure in each entity, right? But when you've got three, definitely when you've got four, you're probably defining, you're, you're, you're crossing a uh, conceptual boundary, right? And that's going to limit your speed. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make it so that things can't evolve independently. And you've got to keep so much more in your head. Large hash maps. Um, like I showed before with, with the user info, where we're setting the favorite color, favorite animal, all that stuff, there's no organization. Every component, it's probably a team of 20 people, like every component, everybody's just throwing stuff into a big map. And if at any point you would print it out, you would just get this huge list of stuff. Where, where, what kind of 
organizing principles are in there? Nothing. It's just like a sock drawer where you just throw all your socks. Uh, so here's, here's an example. Here's my information. This is me. And you see I have email, phone, street one, street two, some favorite things at the bottom. Um, this isn't that big. But it's already got enough stuff that you can start to see some things are more related than others. For example, does my email address go with my favorite color? No, probably not. Not as much as, say, the email address and the phone number. Right? So this, I've kind of refactored it, reorganized it. And we can see that we went from, I don't know, 10 top level keys to three. And Contact info becomes its own thing with its own keys. And then address, oh, all those things are very related. Let's put them in their own map. And then I even did this other thing with the favorites where I split up the key from favorite color, favorite animal. I made favorites and then a little sub map. And you can already start to see that there's little concepts showing up. Like maybe address, we use them enough that we make it our own namespace just for address with its own operations. And maybe contact info has its own stuff too. So we know we call it email and not email hyphen address, right? And we call it phone and not phone number. And same with favorites. Like we have to know that, well, the color is a string and the animal is a keyword. All right, and here's a, another code smell. Um, when, we're, when we're talking with other systems, especially third-party systems, we want to isolate ourselves from them. They could change, and, and, and the data they give us is not necessarily in the structure that we want it. Here, here's an example. Uh, this is an API I use. This is, this is actually 14 screens tall. This, it's JSON, but I turned it into Eden. Um, this is something I had to use, and you know, whenever I'd be at the REPL, like, what keys do I have? Where do they store the, the title of this thing? It was like three things deep. It was a pain. It was a pain. And uh, so I, I went through and I refactored it and I figured out this is the stuff I actually need. It's very small, fits on a slide. A few of these things are just taken out directly. Sometimes I rename the key. Sometimes I had to dig deep to get one of these things out. And sometimes I actually had to do a little bit of calculation. I combined two keys, two values into one value. But there it is. Now, this is something stable that my code can rely on. I just have this one little layer of indirection, this one little translation from what the API gives me to what I let into my system that I can trust. Because before, what I was doing was everywhere I needed a thing, I would just write some, some little code that, that knew about the structure of this JSON that I was getting back. And it was just, it was getting into, a, it was turning into a mess. So I did this. All right, here's my concluding slide. The main thing I want to drill home is know what level of meaning you are at when you're coding. Are you just treating it like a hash map? That's, that's fine. That might be the right thing. Or are you working at the domain level? If you're treating it like a domain level, don't use just a soch or whatever. Right? You should be using an operation that has a name, that has meaning. OK, we, we want to look for these semantic layers. And we, we don't want these deep paths. We don't want to cross into for instance, in a person, you don't want to be talking about the training record. You don't want the person to have to know the structure of that training record. Um, we want to organize these things so that we're not just you know, adding keys willy-nilly all around the code. Um, they should be put into a central place where that defines the thing. Um, combining operations are so important. We tend to, we tend to um, because we can, we tend to just start reaching into data, doing stuff just in line wherever we are, combining, do some, some math on it, and then boom, we got our answer. 
What did that mean? Can it have a name? Is it possible that, that you did some complex operation with combining two things that really should be its own operation semantically? Um, put some gap, some margin, some, some indirection between third party systems and yours. Um, I like using constructors. And then use good names. You should be able to have a small number of operations for each of your little entities that have semantic meaning. OK. Um, thank you very much. My name is Eric Normand. You can find me um, on the internet, lispcast.com, also purelyfunctional.tv. Follow me on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. And while we're here, I'd love to get to know all of you. Thank you very much. We have a microphone up here. Oh, and back there. Um, I was just curious if uh, you have come across libraries in the Costa Rica system where uh, it achieves something along the lines of lenses and hassles, which sort uh, of solve a similar problem. So did you come across something like that? So Spectre uh, is, is very, um, very close to lenses, right? Um, I, when, when I first heard the talk, I thought it was a very impressive system, but for a problem that I didn't experience. Um, and he's a very smart guy, Nathan Mars, the guy who, who wrote Spectre. And um, so he must have this problem. He spent a lot of time on Spectre. Um, so check it out if that's what you're, if you're looking for. Um, but I, I prefer to avoid that problem. I not, not deal with nested stuff so much. So someone, someone um, once told me um, the issue is that people are making these really big, like if you thought about it in types, that people are making these really big types. They should be thinking in, in terms of small types. So even like a list, you think it can be infinite. But the type is small. It just has a head and a rest, a first and a rest. right? It's just a const cell. And you can make a whole list out of that. Um, so you should be thinking in these small pieces that compose together instead of, this is all the stuff I have, so I'll put it in one big type. Other questions? OK. So I'll be here, so find me. <laughs> <laughs>